Hi everybody, this is James Chai, and uh, welcome to Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and I am here on a beautiful Monday. Uh, it is really chilly here in Canada, in Vancouver, Canada, and I don't want to scare people by saying it's cold, but it's cold. I'm even wearing a sweatshirt, so it's, uh, it's a bit chilly. Um, uh, today being Monday, and let me just see, I'm just going to pull this up here so I have my little cheat sheets of pre-notes and all that stuff. Um, and actually, today is just going to be a random questions that I haven't answered from owners uh, about their dysfunctional dogs. So I'll get to that, uh, some of the stuff and all that, and uh, um, you know, eventually figure it all out. I also want to say thank you to uh, one of my followers on YouTube. And um, that person's name is, uh, uh, the handle is Cassian. And, uh, and she said something really kind of cool, and that was, uh, Hey James, I love your work, but it is difficult to share. Uh, these videos, for example, are too long, and I feel sometimes you speak at a level that is a little above uh, layman uh, for uh, people uh, like me, specifically in your videos where we, uh, we actually see you train the, vi the dogs. Uh, maybe you can make more bite-sized videos, a little more scripted, or uh, so you can get to the point faster and such. I'm sure it would help. And that's absolutely a, a super valid um, comment. Like it's 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 totally true, and I appreciate it. And I and I wrote back, and it's actually pinned on my October 12th, um, 2019 episode number 18, where I say, "You're right. It's tough for me as I see dogs' behavior at two tenths of a second, which uh, my mind is processing that fast." Trying to break it down is something I try, including scripting and, and pre-notes, but it's tough to do, right? And being wildly organic, I go on tangents. They are, uh, they are long, you're right. I need to figure out something to make it easier to understand. And yes, they are super long. Uh, and actually, originally when I started doing these vlogs, um, you know, there was like 20 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. I'm thinking, well, 40 minutes is a long time. And uh, now I'm hitting two hours on a sesh, uh, upwards of two hours last few times now. So I want to kind of change that. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm, I'm grateful for your advice. I'll try to improve my format tonight. So thank you. So instead of uh, being able to approve, because I, um, I, 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 I had to um, uh, answer some people who had made some uh, um, interesting comments and all that stuff, I just wanted to be able to um, get some questions out. And, and uh, I didn't get a chance to do that. Didn't get a chance to go over my pre notes. Plus, yesterday was Thanksgiving here in Canada, in Vancouver. Uh, my friends Debbie and Mike, they had a huge uh, thing of. Uh, of dinner and all that stuff. It was absolutely amazing. I mean, I don't eat meat, so I could just uh, I could eat all the stuff. I can't wait till they uh, uh, continue making uh, and improving the cost of clean meat. Clean meat is, and as bad as it sounds, clean meat is grown in the lab. And uh, the benefit of something like that is, aside from the fact that you know you can with cows and so forth like that, you have to use a lot of land mass, etc. When it comes to meat that is, uh, you know, meat. Uh, that's grown in a the lab, they can vertically grow. Right? That, no one's really talked about it, but, you know, as opposed to using all this land, they're just basically vertically stacking uh, floors and, and, and growing it that way, which greatly and uh, reduce the cost of uh, meat. It'll be a less uh, impactful on the environment as we um, we look into the generationally uh, perspective-wise. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Laurie. I mean, I tried to, and then, you know, I had to reply, uh, as you know, and I was like, ah, well, I don't want to be a jerk, and I, I, I want to be respectful of people. And, um, you know, you know me, I'm, I'm quite passionate in my defenses and offenses of statements, so I want to do that. Uh, I want to thank the people who are watching me. I want to thank the people who are trainers and behaviors who are also in the um, um, other aspects of dog uh, profession in regards to dog walkers and, and groups and so forth like that, daycares and all that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered, and I am humbled. Um, that people who are um, uh, my peers are watching and, and learning from me and also uh, people who have trolled me in the past like I say they are I, I heard word about it that they have watched me and um, um, you know it, it's it's flattering and I appreciate it I wish that we didn't have such a, a, a difficult time in the past where people would troll me and, and go after me which was about three and a half years and and like I say some people were quite brutal with uh, how they attack me. And there's still those out there that are going to, and you can't change the world. There's always somebody out there who wants to watch the world burn, and, and when the world burns, then nobody benefits. So it's kind of a bit of a tough thing like that. Uh, and um, this is episode 20. So I'm going to keep trying to do this on a daily basis. Uh, tomorrow I've got some sessions, because today's a stat holiday here in Canada. Trying to get to some stuff, maybe get a bit more structure in regards to uh, what's going on. 
But I'm using the uh, the cover, the auspice of uh, this being random uh, questions from owners about dysfunctional dogs. Excuse me. You know what I did? I opened up a can of, uh, of uh, Zevia, and uh, silly me, I didn't realize that it's got the carbonated bubbles and all that stuff. So I apologize. I'm not trying to be rude or just burping every once in a while. So I've tried to be slightly polite, um, you know, gentleman-like. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I want to do, I want to start doing as well, for people here in Vancouver or Lower Mainland, I wouldn't mind having a meetup, and I, I talked about this uh, last week sometime, about just getting people together. We can go for a coffee somewhere at a restaurant and just have a bunch of people or a few people, whatever, uh, just sitting there talking about dogs and questions. And, you know, it'd be a free question and answer aspect of it. People can ask and talk about their dogs and so forth like that. So I hope that can happen. Uh, it's all part of my um, desire to you know, help support our own community that we we love. Uh, we love the dogs. All breeds, doesn't matter. And, um, you know, again, like I have to, to say, uh, when it comes to specific breeds, uh, I try not to talk about specific breeds, but I do talk about Great Danes. reason why is because they are my personal breed favorite. And so I'm going to talk about that way. Uh, so that way I'm not making other breeds feel bad, right? Because there's uh, uh, Pyrenees, there's labs or the chihuahuas or all different types of breeds. And if I start talking about that breed or, or you know, even the much misaligned uh, um, pit bulls, then it just adds fuel to the fire. Because then people say, well, you know, the pit bulls are bad already. And that guy James talks about them instead of Great Danes. So I want to, uh, uh, <laughs> well, you know, what? If, you, if you start walking now, Lori, you'll make it this weekend, I think. Um, so... Lori said, geez, that's a long way from South Louisiana, 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 I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so I, I stick with the Great Danes, uh, uh, again, because that's my preference. And yes, they are, uh, they, they are, uh, you know, Apollo uh, of dogs. They're called the Apollo of dogs. They're called the Gentle Giants. Uh, Great Danes go back to uh, British history back in the, you know, 1800s to the early 1900s as well as they go back to the pyramids, to the Egyptian times when Great Danes lived with the pharaohs and so forth. Or the, uh, I don't know what they call the, the, the queen, uh, queens, right. So they lived there. There's, there's signs of that aspect. So it's a, a very regal, uh, a regal breed for sure. And I, and I am aware of this, obviously, why I have Great Danes. But again, at the same time, is I don't want people, um, uh, I, w I, don't, nah, I can't stop you all, but I just prefer to put it out that Great Danes have that potential because a lot of times people say and everyone says, oh, I didn't know Great Danes were like that. And then when we talk about the significance of the Great Dane, then people are like, I didn't know that. I'd rather, again, have people realize that they have to control the, their, their, their dogs, Great Danes, their dogs, as they have to control their children. You have to teach them, you have to socialize them, and then create the integration. And the worst part is if a Great Dane does cause an issue he's singled out because uh, or she is singled out because they're a great dane 100 150 pound 200 250 pound well 245 pounds right so the max uh, was that uh, one um they then get singled out and they they're killed because of the size uh, then also great danes mastiffs other large breed giant dogs uh, when they are surrendered to a shelter system they are one of the last ones to be adopted because of their size the cost and if they have any type of behavioral issues, they're usually killed or rescue only in that designation because of the uh, significance of uh, potential injury. Again, if you have a Great Dane and you have, you've seen the pictures where the Great Danes are, you know, Anthony's head is literally twice the size, of th two and a half, well, almost three times the size of mine and probably weighs that much as well. Um, and now Mickey and Anthony are going over some bones literally in front of me like last time, right? Here we go again. There they are. Minky, see, Minky's got the bone, and so that's what I say is uh, we can work with resource guarding as well, uh, just by talking to them and just letting them know that they're not allowed to do these things. Sounds simple, but it is that part of, oh, I'm just going to switch this forward a bit, I'm sorry. Uh, it sounds simple, the way I talk about it, I have previous episode regard to um, uh, getting your dog to stop barking out the window. I know uh, Debbie, actually, uh, my friends uh, who had uh, invited me over for Thanksgiving, German Shepherd that they have, and she, uh, Ada, was always barking out the window, barking, 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 barking. And uh, the nice thing is that um, Debbie's been doing what I said on here, 
I mean, she knows she's gonna say, "Hey, James, what do I do? Phone me up, right?" Uh, but um, um, she, it's working for her. So it's just being constant and consistent. Same thing with the bathroom, right? The other day, I was talking about how and why your dog walks and follows us into the bathroom all the time because they just see it as just another incidental aspect of the home, domesticated aspect of it, the codependency issues, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it just all makes sense. So uh, it's, I, I want to appreciate. Uh, I say I appreciate. Really love the fact that people are responding back, commenting, sending me messages and saying, you know what, it makes sense, or I appreciate your vlog, I appreciate the things you're saying, and, uh, you know, can't wait to see you get into more depth. Um, you know, Cassian saying that part about it being a bit too complicated. I apologize. Um, it's just tough for me because, again, I am really processing things uh, really quite quickly, and in my head, I don't think of things as a linear aspect, like an analog aspect, or, or even kind of a bit of a fluctuation in that envelope of processing. I see things in a, uh, I think a lot of us artists out there, a lot of us organic people, you know, uh, 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 healing kind of aspects of us, a lot of us see, feel, sense things in more of a cloud, right? Well, I call it a cloud, but it's more like a plasmic thing. It's more of a quantum uh, aspect of how we process. Uh, for me, I process uh, quite in depth and everything that I do has multi levels of application. So even if I talk about saying to the, our dogs to stop yelling out the window, it's also about conversation, it's about uh, connection, it's about respect, it's about building up the dog's security, the confidence aspect, the pack posi uh, position in the family, right? All those aspects of relevance, everything counters it all by being simple. I mean, when we were cave people uh, running around and all that stuff, uh, and I know people are going to say, well, James, you believe in God, which I, I do, I'm baptized and everything like that. But I believe the concept of time is a bit more stretched out than just one day here, two days, and sixth day, and seventh day God rested. Uh, I think more like the million years is one day for God in that sense of it. Because, you know, anyways, we go on that theology some other time. We could have a different coffee. <coughs> um, you know, the concepts are really quite uh, uh, different in the way when I see dogs. I remember there's one time um, when I had uh, two of my dogs who were just like face to face with each other as I was walking by them. Uh, through a small area it was, uh, it was Walter and um, and William and they were walking uh, through a, a short little hallway and uh, uh, William had made a certain type of movement and Walter made a certain type of movement which would have been potentially uh, significant in interaction and I had noticed that and then they kind of self-regulated walked away from each other and from the time where I re saw that to the time I sat down to my table, which was like 12, 14 feet away, I already had an understanding of what happened in that type of interpretation, which I talked about the other day. Interpretation, misinterpretation of behavior. When people say the two dogs, they faced each other in the dog park or on leash. They look like they were great. Both tails are wagging. And then suddenly one dog attacked the other dog. Interpretation or misinterpretation regards to negotiating and so forth like that and aspects of behavior, defensive measures, etc. Um, so, like I say, it, it took me less than 15, 12, 15 feet to have the concept of it and then it took me a couple of days to figure it all out. By end. It's all inherent with the way I deal with the dogs in general so then it makes sense because if I can put this piece together with this puzzle piece, it just... It all makes sense, and I don't try to complicate what I'm thinking, even though I express it in a very uh, uh, complex manner. But realistically, Anthony, 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 Anthony is standing right beside Minky, and Minky's licking Anthony's side, and then Minky's walking away because Minky knows that Anthony wants his bone, that he's a raw beef bone, etc., etc. So we're doing that. So I'm just uh, Anthony. So just talking to them, right, and just letting them keep in check, just like you would with a team. Anthony, Minky, Minky, Anthony, Anthony, thank you. Okay, Anthony, come here. Right. So um. So now we got Anthony to, to stop. Minky, stop. Okay. Um. So anyhow, it's so the concepts that we have when we're thinking about things. You know, again, using our intuition is the most important thing that we have. We have to trust ourselves. Our intuition is what makes us and helps us and, and assists us into falling in love with somebody or or with a with a you know another animal, but not another with an animal. I'm sorry, not another animal because you can't cheat on one dog, right? Haha. <laughs> um, but it is what what we fall in love with. It's our gut feeling, our our our, our eternal quest for true love. 
it is our uh, our uh, desire to procreate, to do more of us, to create more of us. It is our narcissistic it's our excuse to be narcissistic as well. That's what love is, because then with narcissism, it's like, oh, how much we love each other. And narcissism is in the point of falling in love with somebody because then that person tells you how much they love you. Narcissistic aspect of, of love, which is survival on the Darwinian aspect of, of that by procreating and creating greater more things, blah, 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 right? So like I say, anybody ever wants to have a little bit more in-depth discussion about things, we're, then we're talking about concepts that are more on the uh, the visceral, the evolution aspect of it, the uh, um, base genetic aspect of consciousness to begin with. Um but yeah, okay, so anyhow, uh, I'm going to go on to the, to the additional questions and all that stuff there that I didn't get a chance to. Two questions, one is from Amy. Um, oh, all right, Amy, well, actually, I did talk about that before, and, and Rita. Okay, so I apologize for that. So those two are, 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 are done. Uh, I can't be talking about it. Let me just have a sit here. You know what I want to talk about then? It's dogs circling when they're happy at dinner time. Have you ever noticed that when you, you, you bring out the food or, or or you're just starting to, you just have to make that little clinking sound, but when you pick up the bowl and they're like, rrr, rrr, and they're all over and they're like looking at you and some of the dogs are very happy when they start running around back and forth, they can't control themselves, they're excited, right? So they can't control the emotion because again, they can only, uh, dogs can only process emotions on a rudimentary basis. Dogs can only process to the capacity of their sophisticated brain development, which is not that sophisticated. So to them, dogs are processing things at just a really basic level, right? It's just like, um, like a two-dimensional concept in regards to uh, appreciating the joy, but they are so simplistic, dogs are so simplistic in their emotional process, the emotional understanding that they go right off the, uh, you know, to the to 10 out of 10 on the scale because they're so like all the way they go full in right they jump right in and that's something that um when your dog sees you getting food ready they're excited they're happy like oh my gosh i get to eat and i don't have to hunt for anything i don't have to kill anything i just get you know my my human brings it to me my parents bring it to me and i don't have to do anything they're super excited they're going around in circles etc uh dogs will go in circles depending on either their left turning dog or a right turning dog and i think i mentioned that to jackie who uh, who, who who founded Awesome, uh, great, uh, sorry, awesome, massive lovers in regards to her, uh, her great Dane, not a massive, but her great Dane, Apollomy, 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 sorry, um, uh, who, who I was talking about, she, her Dane is a left turning great Dane, a Harlequin, beautiful, uh, beautiful girl. She's like eight months or something, like 100 pounds already. So, again, like I say, you know, eight month old uh, great Dane is 100 pounds or 90 pounds or 80 pounds, whereas a, an eight month old black lab might be like 40 50 pounds right so uh, twice as big etc etc um so when the dog your dog is waiting for you to feed them right and so here this is totally random because i haven't even thought about this aspect of it uh, any of these questions but uh, i mean like i started mentioning it before so the dogs your dog is so happy to eat right because then they they that's joy right one of the things i said that dogs are always seeking in everything even past food because of food motivation, counterintuitive in, in the aspect of uh, the dog's covert, overt, I mean, overt aspects. Food is not a communication tool, etc., etc. But what do dogs absolutely love at the end of the day? They love companionship. They love the codependency above even food and that part of it. Because if a dog is starving, he's not going to leave you most times unless he's found a prey to catch or something like that. But they will follow you wherever you go if you're lost in the woods or something like that, right? You know? There's stories about children being lost and the dog or the guy's lost or the woman's lost and their dog stays with them even though and keeps body warmth and so forth like that, right? That codependency. Um, when it comes to food, it's a joy aspect for the dog. The ultimate thing that they want to be is content, safe, happy, joy. Food makes them happy because what happens, the dog goes out there and they can be predatorial and they want to kill uh, uh, a prey and another animal to eat. And then after they've eaten, what do they do? They lay down, they sleep. So they fill up, fill up the hunger pangs, right? The natural aspect of survival, they fill it all up. I'm sorry, I'm going to try to keep it kind of simple here again because uh, um, uh, it, it's a very valuable thing Cassian said. Uh, so they're happy, right? Your, the, your dog is joyful, right? The ones in the wild, they just, the only reason they're hunting is because they have to survive. They feel that hunger pain, which goes back to the pain aspect of how dogs process pain. 
Do you see what I mean? Everything goes back to the circular center point, right? The, 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 the center of the universe, so to speak. Everything goes back to this point of codependency. Uh, anyways, okay. So I got to comment down a bit here. Uh, but... So when your dog, uh, when a dog has already hunted its prey and and and, and taken it down and eaten uh, prey, right? Another animal, then they just they the cash, right? They sleep. They're just like, okay, we don't need to hunt anymore. We don't care. They see another animal running along the outskirts of their uh, their area, their territory. They're just like, okay, whatever. They're not gonna hunt it because they're satisfied. They're satiated. They're happy. They're joyful, right? You see the dogs laying uh, with each other. They're just like, yeah, that's all we want. And why do I say, well, that dogs, you know, ultimately their their quest emotionally is joy, is happiness, is contentment, is codependency. You see all these uh, uh, these abuse cases of dogs. They've been beaten, and not the ones that are dysfunctional and reactive, but you see the abuse cases where dogs are just like shut down, or they're, you know, they've got serious injuries and all that. And somebody comes, a rescuer comes and saves them, and the dog starts whacking their tail. Dog's so happy, and you pet them, and even if they're skinny, they're starving, and the and all the ribs are showing, the spine is ridged back, and everything like that. People start petting the dog, and the dog is happy. He's joyful. If you had food, the the dog is not that that dog's not even gonna be able to eat the food because they're so hungry, and you have to do different types of feeding on him or her. But you pet them, and they still find the energy to be petted, to be joyful, to be happy, to celebrate that codependency, that connection. So getting back to feeding your dog at home, they're happy, they're joyful, right? It's that underlying aspect of emotional uh, behavior, that the key root of the dog. Again, codependency. Our, our humans got us food, right? They don't care where it comes from. They got us food. Yeah, we're so happy. And, and they're running around in joy because they're like, yee this is it. You don't see a dog out in the wild. You don't see canines. Minky, stop it. You don't see canines. Minky. Those canines in the yeah, now there's three of them. See, okay, sorry, I, I was a little too fast. Uh, you don't see the canines right in the wild jumping for joy when 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 you know the prey they, they all go right in to kill to, to rip apart and so forth like that to to, to, to dismember. Uh, I don't want to be graphic, sorry. Um, so they're at home, they're all happy, okay, and. Uh, they're running around in circles emotionally like that, and that's an emotionally strong dog in that sense of it. When they're happy, they're joyful, right? Even the most, you know, kind of, you know, all kinds of dogs. Oh, okay, sorry, somebody's, somebody's texting me here. Okay, um, sorry, I should have turned it off. Okay, so that's the one part, right? So when your dog's circling around, you're really happy, and one of the things I always do is I talk to them. And I talk to them in somewhat a happy mood, and but I say it happy, but I still talk slower. I don't like, oh, good job. And like, oh, da, da, da. I'm talking slower. Like, okay, dinner's coming. Yeah, are you hungry? Good stuff. Good boy. I'm using the same type of verbal uh, verbalization, the language that I would when I'm training them or passively training them or in motion training dogs. I'm always using the same language. Same thing when I tell them to stop yelling. I'm using the same language, the same tone of voice, reasonably with a little bit happier tone of voice when I'm talking. Talk to them about to feed them, and while they're running around in circles, so that they hear the calms, even though they're full of joy and they're running back and forth and all that stuff, and they're super excited. I calm them down. I bring them down. I let the dogs know that in their excitement, they're still hearing the word of calmness, the words, uh, my voice, my tone, in control. So I'm being consistent that even if they're jerky and they're trying to attack other people, or they're super skittish, I use the same language and same voice key with them when they're excited or when they're uh, uh, disturbed. And that's one of the parts where I want to uh, stick with them and now they're getting a little bit hungry because I hear, I'm i using that voice. Um, so uh, I'll get to that in a bit because I mean I, I started late and I need to uh, kind of keep this short too. So so they're really happy, right? So that's again, use that same tone voice. Uh, I always say good boy when I feed them. And when I have them, uh, when I see them drinking water afterwards, I always say to them, good boy, or a good uh, William, good Minky, Minky, right? I always say those names, I always say those names as well. And um, now, they're, now they're getting a little antsy and all stuff. Minky, stop it. Um, there, right? Like I said, if you're talking to your dogs and they're listening to you and you're not being upset, you're just using regular tone of language, they're going to listen when you need to get upset for whatever reason. If they're about to attack each other, 
you raise the tone of voice and it's still stable so they're not feeling like they're in trouble. They're just like, uh oh, dad's using his dad voice, right? Mom's using her mom's voice. Um, but again, yeah, so I always use that complimentary aspect of, uh, of talking. Dog is drinking water, good boy. Why? Because it reinforces that command of praise. Passive training. The dog is already drinking. Uh, uh, our dogs go outside to go pee, like I said in another episode, right? Seniority bases, acknowledgement, safety, and all that. But I still just say the same thing. Good boy, go pee, ha ha, all these positive words. I don't want to use their names now because I'm hoping they're not going to come back in. But, you know, it's like, good boy, Carlson. Good job, Carlson. And when they're drinking water, good boy, Carlson. So it is a replacement of giving the dog a treat. Because then they're associating, associating with positive aspect. Like I said before, too, is, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're working for somebody and you do all this work and you keep working your butt off and you keep working your butt off and you, and you never get acknowledged for it, you're just like, this sucks. But if you're working hard and you're working hard and someone goes, you know what, I want to just say to you, I know you've been working hard for the last two months. I want to say thank you. You're, you're doing an amazing job. Really appreciate the value that you have uh, as a person, as, as a contributor, as a professional to this. want to thank you, right? You want to hear the compliments. Same thing with the, your child coming up to you with a, a, you know, a couple of crayon lines. And this is like the 700th one they've given you. Like, good job, good job. We want to acknowledge them, but we also want to reinforce that complimentary tone of voice. Uh, I'm going to end this pretty soon. Um, just because it's almost, uh, it's almost, it's quarter to ten, and uh, <laughs> they haven't eaten. So you can see, and then now there's Sammy because Sammy's out of bone, and Sammy's, Sammy's got two legs, and she's 27 pounds, and she's not a happy girl sometimes with the big boys, and they run away from her. Uh, the other part about dogs circling, though, when it comes to eating, is watch the dogs that have dysfunction. Those of you who have dogs that are somewhat dangerous, that are somewhat through a life of an abuse. You see that they don't run around so happily. And you see sometimes with context, and I'll get to this at another time, but you see in context sometimes that they walk slower and they're more muscular in their behavior, and that's a predatorial behavior that the dogs are doing. Watch those dogs of yours. Those of you who have dogs that are reactive, dangerous, etc., that are socially and emotionally uh, uh, retarded in their in their maturity. When you watch them, you see the way their behaviors. You see the way they're walking around. And when they t walk around in circles, or they walk around your home as you're preparing dinner, in their anticipation, you see them walking like a predator. And it's absolutely magnificent and it's absolutely brilliant. But they're walking around like a predator. Um, you want to watch that type of because that is a behavior that you want to correct in the sense of acknowledging it to your dogs when you're seeing them walking like that that's when you want to change the tone of voice to bring up a bit higher so that as much as they're focused to look in their primal aspect of, uh, of, of, of drive where they're thinking of killing something to eat it right they have to find something to kill when we change that tone and we bring it up positively then it makes our dog hear a positive aspect compared to the negative primal drive on it and then they somewhat get disrupted from being focused on that so that the next time they're in the mode which is when they go outside and they're reactive and they're skittish or whatever they're reactive outside when we bring that mode differently then we make the adjustment for them because then they're hearing like oh, this is great this is cool this is really nice right we want to make that adjustment um but i will let you guys go i know it's super late uh, i really appreciate everyone watching this uh, it's been a bit of a random day in the sense of uh, questions and all stuff. It's a bit stat holiday here, uh, you know, Monday being the stat holiday. If you have any questions, I'm going to try to answer them tomorrow uh, and uh, have up some other stuff and maybe get a little bit more detail on something more specific and give you some uh, anecdotes anecdotes from my, my day with uh, maybe training somebody, uh, somebody's dog, I mean. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy Monday. And uh, I guess you guys are going to have your Thanksgiving in the United States later on. I want to wish everyone an amazing start of my day week. Uh, I know there's a lot of tough things that are going on in the world right now, some really uh, horrific things that are going on in the world right now. Uh, if we can collectively focus and maybe you know convince those people who are in power to, uh, to, to change the, uh, the behaviors and, and the global decisions, the decisions that they've made um, to change um, uh, some of the most uh, uh, preventable, uh, horrific uh, uh, environments that are occurring now. Um, 
in another part of the world. I mean, that's just uh, uh, subhuman um, for those type of decisions to have been made so callously as a cover uh, for other criminal behavior. Um, okay, so that's my political statement. I, I want to kind of keep that a little bit clean from here. But thank you again for, for watching. The dog is here. We'll see that. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's William, right, with the bone. And there's Mickey with the bone right there. And there's Anthony right there as well. So, uh, like I say, resource guarding, all those aspects of it, it can all be dealt with from dogs that are significantly uh, guarded with their food and, and high targets such as raw beef bones. And also, they're literally sitting. Before, here's one right here, uh, right there. Oh, sorry. Uh, here's. I was just gonna say. Here's these guys. There's William, and then there's Minky right beside him, uh, as they are wanting to eat stuff from each other, which would be a cause for a huge, significant issue. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. We'll talk tomorrow. Bye bye.